shocking betrayal, best friend crosses the line with my husband. I, 28F, have been together with my husband 27M for six years, married for four, and we have two daughters, 3F and almost 1F. Our relationship is everything I could have hoped for. He's an incredible husband and father, and I love him deeply. His actions always reassure me that he feels the same. Falling asleep in his arms every night is pure bliss. Last weekend, we had friends over for a barbecue. We were all outside when my husband, grilling, went inside briefly. Unbeknownst to me, my best friend, 28F, followed him. She surprised him as he returned, pulling him into a kiss. Shocked, he pushed her away, yelling in disbelief. She fled in tears. He immediately told me what happened privately. I kept it together for our guests, but inside, I was devastated after everyone left. My husband sat me down and told me what happened and showed me the footage from our living room camera. It was exactly as my husband has described it. My best friend of 10 years, the person who I treated as my literal sister, forcibly kissed my husband. After the third date with my husband, she was the one I told that I was going to marry him. She knows how much I love him and how strong our relationship is, and still she chose to try to come in the middle. For fuck's sake, our three-year-old calls her auntie. My best friend tried showing up the next day, just to talk, and my husband had to hold me back from beating the shit out of her, and he kicked her out and told her to not come back. It's been almost a week now, and I'm nowhere close to moving on. I don't blame my husband one bit. He's completely innocent in this and if anything, he's the victim. I've been lying down on my husband's chest and just crying every day and night. I'm so angry and frustrated and don't know what to do. My husband has been amazing and like always, he just gets it and understands how I'm feeling. He brought me flowers almost every day and cooked my favorite meals multiple times in the last few days. I love and appreciate him all the more for it. I just don't know how I'm going to move on and trust any of my friends again after this. After reading a lot of the comments, I realized that it was possible that my husband was having an affair with my best friend, and he knew about the camera and acted accordingly to make sure I didn't suspect an affair. Her running out of the house crying, my husband showing me the footage before I asked, and his love bombing would all make sense if he was cheating with my best friend. I can't be with a cheater and I had to make sure my husband was loyal to me. On a side note, I made sure that my husband was okay and well after being forcibly kissed, and he said he was fine, and he didn't feel assaulted, and it was just a kiss. He said that he was just worried about me because he knew how much this friendship meant to me. Over the weekend, I looked through my husband's phone and laptop while he was doing yard work. Both of us have full access to each other's phones, and I didn't find anything out of the ordinary in my husband's phone. I checked his messages, WhatsApp, social media, and deleted messages folder. There was nothing suspicious on his phone or laptop. This morning after my husband left to go to work, I arranged for our next-door neighbors, a friendly elderly couple, to watch the girls for a couple of hours, and I went to my best friend's place without telling her I was coming. She works afternoon shifts so I knew she would be there in the morning. She let me in and she seemed scared, and I demanded to know the truth. She said that she had always been really attracted to my husband, and she had tried making advances before, but my husband always just shut her down. She admitted to being jealous of me and my perfect life with my husband. I should have seen the signs earlier. When our firstborn was learning to speak, my best friend would always try to get her to call her mama. When she held our daughter for the first time, she accidentally sat in my husband's lap. She has been trying to replace me for years, and I never noticed and my husband kept rejecting her advances because he only wanted me. She said that she had drank more than she should have at the barbecue, and she decided to try her luck when she saw my husband was going inside alone. I forced her to show her phone as well and again. There was nothing implying an affair, and all the messages appeared to line up with my husband's phone so I knew there was nothing deleted or manipulated. She apologized profusely and asked me to not end our friendship over this. I told her that she's nothing to me and she could have been happy for me and I treated her like a sister all these years just for her to try and steal my life. Now I know for sure that my husband never cheated, the guilt for doubting him is eating me up. If I tell him that I snooped through his phone and laptop and met up with my ex-best friend to verify that he wasn't cheating, it's going to impact our marriage and he'll be very disappointed in me for not trusting him and if anything, he will lose his trust in me. If I don't tell him, the guilt is going to continue eating me up. I've never lied or kept secrets from him before and I don't want to start now, but this is an impossible choice. He's only ever shown me how much he loves and cherishes me and he doesn't deserve to be betrayed like this. I will update more when I tell him the truth. I told my husband everything, that I looked through his phone and laptop and that I confronted ex-best friend. I showed him both Reddit posts and told him that even the few comments that speculated that he was having an affair made me paranoid and I acted on it. I apologized to him for doubting him and thanked him for always being an amazing husband and always turning down her advances and for spoiling me, especially when I was down. 
He said that he understands, and he said he should have told me earlier about her trying her luck earlier. I'm also starting therapy next week to figure out my paranoia and trust issues, process the end of my friendship, and in general try to get into a better mental space, so I can be better as an individual, wife and mother. I am a wedding photographer and I have currently come across my first wedding that I am considering cancelling. I booked the wedding several months ago, in February and we talked on the phone once then. They said that they had a general area that they wanted to film in, but not an exact location. I said that would be fine if they kept me up to date. They also never gave me an exact time. I messaged them throughout the coming months and never got replies or updates. I contacted them again on the 10th of June, the wedding is on the 30th, and still no reply. So I contacted another vendor they are working with. According to that vendor, they have completely changed plans, moving the wedding to a location three hours away, at 5 m, and with a two mile hike to the location. I have had no confirmation from the wedding party. I was never able to get them to sign a contract stating the deliverables or the price, but they did pay me in advance. Would I be overreacting to cancel the wedding plans last minute? The wedding is five days from now. I didn't want to cancel, but now I feel I have no choice. What if I drive three hours to find that they changed locations yet again? I would at least partially refund them, if not fully refund them. But I owe. Any advice? Relevant comments from both subs. Commenter, I think you are ente if you are being honest. They should have the decency to tell you any changes to the plan. I understand that they may be stressed with the planning but they should have responded to you reaching out. OP, they have sent me one message that says, the plan hasn't changed, but I don't know what the plan was in the first place. And if I'm to believe the other vendor, it sounds like it has changed quite a bit. Commenter, I would cancel. What other option do you have really? Wait around for a last minute call to be told location, did they pay enough for all of the time, six hours of driving etc etc. OP, no, travel was never accounted for because I was under the impression that the venue was an hour away. At this point the amount of driving is longer than the wedding time I was booked for, a four hours. Commenter gives a detailed response. I think this is why I will do thank you for the detailed response. I like that you mentioned travel arrangements as well because on our initial phone call they mentioned something about ferry ride through the park. They haven't provided any more detail on that either, like should I have bought myself a ticket? Would they provide one for me? Is it still even happening? Etc. The other vendor gave me a very sketchy timeline of events, stating that the two miles hike was time stamped for 10 minutes. So I'm sure you're right that if we didn't get up the hike on time they would blame it all on me grinning face with sweat. I just sent the bride a text she never gave me her email, and a refund through Venmo. I'm sad to see the money go but relieved to not be a part of this fiasco anymore. Here's the message I sent the bride. Hi bride, given my multiple attempts to contact you and the fact that I have not received crucial information about your wedding, including the exact location, time and schedule, and we are less than a week out from your wedding date. I unfortunately have to treat this as a de facto cancellation. I have been in contact with your other vendor and the information that they have provided me on the wedding does not match what we discussed over the phone. I have contacted you several times asking for more detail and I have been met with no response. With the lack of information and communication, I cannot safely perform my job. I cannot be sure that the information that I have is accurate, and so I can no longer attend. I'll be sending you a full refund since this cancellation is so last minute and I wish you the best. Thanks. Thanks to everyone for the advice, if she ever replies to me, I'll post another update. OP clarifies. I'm the second shooter, they hired too. The other photographer is also planning the whole wedding officiating, so they don't have time to capture everything. She immediately called me, funny since she's never replied this quickly before, and left me a voicemail apologizing and begging for me to reconsider. She said she still hasn't finalized the location, but is asking her other vendor tonight. I guess the other vendor is also the wedding planner and has planned everything sort of. They offered me more money and to call to explain everything over the phone. They also said they didn't respond to my messages because they've been out of the country. So I gave them a detailed list of everything I would need if I were to reconsider them as a client and said that if we verbally agreed they would have to sign a contract or I would not show up. I also want them to accommodate me for travel fees. So if they call me back by 5 p.m. today with all of the details I asked for and an increased payment plan, I'm going to reconsider taking the job. I still want the money and the experience, so if they can accommodate me, I'll do what I can. OP comments on the OG contract. I was way too forgiving about the contract thing, 
I sent it to them several times and just figured they were busy with other wedding plans, so that's why I put off canceling for so long. I was just way too accommodating eat anxious face with sweat I posted two updates BTW. They doubled the amount and paid for a hotel near the venue. I'm morbidly curious to see how this whole thing turns out, so I'm going. I sent them a contract that says if I can't find them out there, I'm leaving and keeping the payment. Also told them, if they don't sign the contract by the day before the wedding, I'm not going and I'm not giving back any of the money, which they have already given me. The wedding is taking place by a lake near the hiking trail, they insist we won't be hiking the full 45-minute trail, also worked that into the contract, if they make me hike more than 20 minutes with all my stuff I'm stopping right there. There's going to be a ferry ride across the lake after the ceremony. Also looked into their other photographer slash wedding planner, and they've been plagiarizing all of the work on their website. The photos they show are all square space default photos and photos from other copyright-free websites. So I won't be surprised if they're being completely scammed and I get to leave anyway. So anyway, I think my butt is covered now. I'll give updates after the wedding. As a gesture of goodwill they booked me a hotel. When I looked up directions to the hotel, it was in a town four hours away from the venue. They clearly had no idea where anything was in relation to their venue. So obviously I didn't stay there. All the hotels that were near their venue were booked, so I ended up driving out to the venue at 2 a.m. to get to the wedding at 5 a.m. I was the first person there. The sun was already rising BTW. Actually, the sun rises around 3.45. They wanted a sunrise wedding, but egg they didn't actually look up what time the sun rises here, and just assumed 5 a.m. The wedding party arrived at 5.30. We couldn't do anything until the wedding planner slash photographer arrived, because no one knew where the actual ceremony was supposed to take place. The planner arrived at 5.45. The ceremony was actually really beautiful, it's too bad the planner stood in front of my tripod the entire time. I got footage on my handheld, but it would have been nice to have usable tripod footage. The planner also turned off the mic I had placed to capture the vows. I don't know why she thought she could touch my stuff without permission, but that was super cool. Also weird thing, she kept taking pictures of her feet. Like constantly. I'd be working and she'd be taking another foot pic. Ike man. The bride and groom asked me to follow them to another location for a ferry ride. They told me it would be a 10 minute drive, it was an hour drive. I was well within my rights to turn around and quit now that I had my contract, but I was feeling nice and figured the more time driving the less time actually spending with these people. We arrive at the ferry, which was actually just a little tour boat, and the wedding party was astonished to find that they were supposed to make a reservation. Their wedding planner had told them not to worry about it, but the boat needed to be reserved weeks in advance. So we ended up going on a hike in the area. It started pouring rain and flooding the trail, but the bride and groom kept their wedding clothes on, even through all the mud and water. There was a waterfall at the end of the trail that they tried to climb up. I didn't want to die, so I declined to climb the slippery rocks next to the cliff with tumbling rapids. I turned around and drove the three to four hours home and crashed for about 24 hours. Hopefully they got home safely too. Sorry for not updating sooner, I was horribly exhausted. The wedding was not as bad as I thought, but if they hadn't paid me more I wouldn't have gone. The couple was really nice, just horrible communicators, and with bad judgment on trusting this photographer slash wedding planner. The planner was the true villain IMO. Emotional discovery, my dad's unforgettable journey to find his roots. I'm not sure if this is the right place to share, but I just need to express my excitement somewhere. Shout out to r slash for introducing me to this subreddit. As the title suggests, my dad, 56M, was adopted shortly after birth. He grew up in eastern Canada, without actively seeking out his biological parents. To him, the parents who raised him are his true parents, and he cherishes them deeply. They've been incredible grandparents to my sister, 19F and me, 22M. All he possessed from his birth parents was a letter, explaining that he was born out of love, but they couldn't provide for him. So when my sister decided to get him a genetic test for Christmas, it was purely with the intention to find out what ethnicity we all are, and the thought of finding his birth parents didn't even cross our minds. Eventually, when we got his results, we were surprised to find the names of two people with perfect genetic matches to my dad. He had the option to reach out to them, so he wrote them each an email and just waited for their responses. Almost immediately, his biological dad, who I'll call Jim, not his real name, responded. He said how excited and happy he was to have found my dad and how he was looking for him for so long. My dad, who was usually an emotionally reserved man, was curled up on the couch grinning as he was texting Jim for the first time. I was still in shock from the news, but was so happy to see my dad even happier than when I graduated uni. Soon thereafter, he also received a message from his biological mom, Debbie, not her real name. By talking to them both, 
My dad learned the story of his birth and I think that it's absolutely wild. Debbie is the daughter of an Australian mining engineer, and they all moved to Canada for his work when she was in high school. Later on, they moved to the Midwest, where she met Jim at the age of 17. They were high school sweethearts, and were thinking of marriage after they graduated, but then Debbie got pregnant. This being the 60s, this was a huge deal. Her dad was furious, and sent her back to Canada to give birth, and arranged a private adoption, as he knew of a couple who were trying to have a kid, my grandparents. Once she gave birth, she was able to let Jim know that she was being sent back to Australia. They never saw each again for the next 40 years. Jim apparently was only able to move on, once he received a letter over five years later from Debbie, saying that she got married. Eventually he got married too, and they moved to the West Coast, but his wife got into a terrible car crash and lost the use of both legs and one arm, so they were never able to have kids. Debbie had three daughters in Australia, the oldest of which is seven years younger than my dad. They saw each other for the first time around 12 years ago, as they reconnected on Facebook and Debbie happened to be taking a trip to the west coast of America. Both Jim and Debbie had always wanted to keep my dad, and so they tried for decades to find him. But my province apparently is one of the hardest places in the world to find adoption information, especially since my dad only received his birth certificate at his baptism, so their names were not on it. Jim had essentially given up trying to find my dad until genetic tests became popular. He asked Debbie to take every single one, and he did the same, about five years ago, in the hopes that one day my dad would take one. When he received my dad's message, he immediately wrote to Debbie, I found him. Since then, we have had several calls with Jim and his wife, and they are absolutely lovely. We are their only family since they don't have kids and I couldn't be happier. At the end of the month, we'll be flying to the West Coast to meet them. It has been harder to talk to Debbie as Australia is so many hours ahead of us, but she also is so kind and an absolute joy to talk to. I haven't met my three new aunts yet, but apparently one lives in London. It's crazy to think that I might have been within a few kilometers of her the few times I've visited. I also have five new younger cousins. A couple of them are huge fans of Japanese culture, so they're ecstatic to hear that they have half Japanese cousins, my mom is Japanese-Canadian, so my sister and I are both half. We hope to visit them one day in Australia but we might all meet up in Japan next year. I don't know how to end this. I am still processing everything. It's absolutely incredible to have my family grow so much, but also a little overwhelming. I'm so happy for my dad, for Jim, and for Debbie, and I'm so excited to get to know them better. I hope I get to meet my new cousin soon too. I feel so incredibly lucky that this happened, seemingly against all odds. My dad was initially raised francophone, so it's a miracle that they even speak the same language. Anyways, thank you so much for taking the time to read through this, and my apologies for how long this post ended up being. I might post an update after I meet Jim and his wife. I hope you all have a wonderful day. First of all, thank you so much to everyone who left such kind and heartfelt comments on my first post. It's incredible hearing all of your stories. To those who were concerned that we would abandon my grandparents that I grew up with, that is most definitely not the case. They were the people I grew up with, and I absolutely love them two bits, although only my grandmother is still with us. All the incredible times I've had with her growing up are so much more important than blood, and I can't comprehend the stories I read where people forget about their adoptive parents or grandparents when they find their biological ones. I won't recap my previous post here because I'm lazy haha. So we just got back from visiting Jim and his wife, who I'll call Mary, not her real name, on the West Coast, and it was one of the best experiences of my life. We spent a week in their city, and got to experience so much with them. Our first time meeting them in person was very emotional and felt very surreal. We spent the whole day looking through my dad's and our old photos, basically catching Jim up on everything that he has missed over the past 56 years. We also got to see so many of his and Mary's old photos too, which was very cool. We went to a park near their house and on the walk, I heard Jim whisper my son with a massive smile across his face. Throughout the week, we explored their city and saw so many cool sights and tried so much delicious food. Mary knows her city so well, and it was great to see her favorite spots all around the city from food carts to gardens to museums. We all went to an incredible Japanese-American museum and Jim and Mary absolutely loved it, they were very keen to learn about the internment during World War II and said that they knew a bit about it before, but now it feels so personal. We went on two hikes with Jim, Mary wasn't able to come because she is in a wheelchair. It's so cool to have such an active and outdoorsy grandfather who is able to go on such long hikes. He taught us some foraging tips and told us stories from when he used to camp for years on end. Both he and Mary are very spiritual, so he also told us great stories from meditation retreats they've done. He's even tried psychedelics so he's definitely the cool grandpa. I won't delve into specific locations, 
but exploring such an incredible part of the world with amazing people was unforgettable. Saying goodbye at the end of our trip was tough. We all felt a deep sadness. Now I have two new grandparents on the West Coast, and I couldn't be happier. They've warmly embraced us as their grandchildren, which means the world to me. Mary shared that her biggest regret was not having children and grandchildren, but now she feels fulfilled. This experience has profoundly impacted our lives. It's amazing how much joy my sister's DNA test has brought. Our bond with our new grandparents is just beginning, and I'm filled with excitement. Next, we're planning a trip to Australia to meet Debbie. When that happens, I might share another update. Until then, thank you for reading our story, and I wish you all a wonderful day.